Chapter 51, Trek Slash Harbinger All right, how is it? Good, but not as good as the ice disc. Garrett answered Alec as they walked back into the haven. Currently, he was wearing a necklace that bore a disc of orange rock. This orange rock was similar to the ice disc Ava had given him. This was the heat protection item they had found at the Dungeon Association. The cost of one necklace was five gold, and its function was to mitigate the ambient heat. It lowered the heat by about 30 degrees, making it warm but not hot for Garrett. For the same cost, the necklace wasn't nearly as refreshing as the ice disc that actually cooled his body. However, they couldn't expect much from the Dungeon Association that sought to make as much money as possible from the things they sold. Luckily, the necklaces would last three days each. They had bought five on the spot, an amount that would hopefully get them through the job. It was a decent deal, so the group was quick to get back into the dungeon. Garrett could bear the heat much better now, though there were still some signs of perspiration. Unfortunately, Alec could only tell him to drink plenty of water. All right, now that we have that settled, we need to make our way to the farthest haven. I'm thinking we can head to one of the ones in the middle as a rest stop before setting off on the final trek. Sound good? Sounds good. Then let's start. Weapons out. Alec placed his hand on his sheath, prompting the others to check their weapons. Ava had her axe, Dirk had his variety of weapons like the bow, hatchet, knives, and spear, and Kazma had a short magic scepter. This weapon had actually surprised Dirk when he first saw it. It was apparently supposed to slightly amplify her magic ability, whether it was gathering mana or controlling it. The party exited the other side of the haven. From there, as far as the eye could see, there was nothing but sand dunes. This time it was much more treacherous, with large hills and plenty of dune worms. They could only walk onward though. Alec took the lead, turning northeast toward the next haven and marching. The others grouped back up into a diamond shape, keeping their ears out and eyes on the sand. Eventually, they encountered their first dune worm. Dirk heard one slither through the sand at the same time that Alec spotted the moving mound. I got it. Alec unsheathed his sword, keeping an eye on the mound that rapidly approached. When it got close, Alec stabbed down. Shink! The sword buried itself in the sand, but surprisingly, there was no response. Alec was confused before the worm suddenly jumped out of the sand. The worm was a nasty-looking thing that grew to about three feet long and a foot wide. It had no eyes and two rows of long, protruding teeth that looked more like claws. Its carapace matched the sand perfectly while various white hairs stuck out from between its staggered shells, acting as feelers. Upon jumping out of the sand, its teeth pointed out and clamped down on Alec's calf. He panicked as the teeth scratched against his armor and swung his sword down on the worm. Crack! Screech! The worm screamed as the blade struck its shell, breaking through it and cutting flesh. This caused its body to thrash around, and Alec lost his footing. The two went to the floor as the worm continued to chomp at his leg. Alec kept swinging his sword at the worm, breaking its carapace in multiple places and drawing blood. The others watched, unsure of what to do. They couldn't just go up to him and swing their weapon at him. However, Dirk didn't worry about this dilemma as he pulled out his hatchet and rushed over. Stop swinging. When Dirk got close, he punched Alec's hand that gripped the sword. The sword went flying away, and Alec almost wanted to curse at Dirk for a seemingly stupid move. However, Dirk was quick to act, and he brought his hatchet down. Splat. Asterisk screech. Asterisk. The worm screamed even louder as the hatchet plowed straight through the carapace, burying itself into its body. Dirk chopped three times in succession in different places, the last being right on the head. With that, the worm instantly died, letting go of its grip on Alec's leg. Alec huffed, his adrenaline still coursing through his body. Dirk was calm as he pulled out his hatchet, kicking away the worm. You all right? Ah, uh, yeah. Thanks. Alec nodded as he calmed down. He had lost his cool, something that he shouldn't have done. He inwardly cursed himself as he stood up. Here. Oh. 
Dirk handed him his sword as he dusted off sand. By the way, never chop at yourself with a sword. Take out your knife next time. You don't want to take off your own limb. Yeah, you're right. And watch how you flail that thing. You don't want to hit someone that might try to help. Right. Sorry. Alec accepted Dirk's criticisms as he sheathed his blade. He had been momentarily angered by Dirk knocking his sword away, but that was so he could take control of the situation. Regardless, the things he said were common sense for a sword user such as him. He cursed himself again for being so careless. Damn. That worm was strong. Kazma, I would keep your distance from any worms you see. Your armor might keep them from piercing your body, but they will bruise you. I wouldn't be surprised if the stronger ones could break bones with that bite strength. Alex spoke as he massaged his leg. Because he was a body refiner, he could take much more damage before being hurt. However, he was surprised at how heavily those worms could clamp down. Even he might have been bruised, and this was only the first one that they encountered. Kasma nodded seriously. If it could hurt a body refiner, then it would absolutely injure her who wasn't one. This was the major disadvantage to lower tier mages. Until they learned essential skills for movement and protection, they would be susceptible to close range bodily harm. They needed to keep their distance from all enemies. This was why those who could be both mages and body refiners were powerful. Alec could take damage to his body and still function, whereas a normal mage might have already had his bone broken or muscles bruised. However, it was rare to have both an attribute and anima. Placing his hand on his leg, Alec closed his eyes. There was a soft glow of light for a few seconds before dimming. He then shook his leg out. Okay, I think I'm good. Let's reshape into a triangle and keep going. Kazma, you can move with Garrett. Alec directed his group. Kazma nodded and moved next to Garrett. Dirk then moved up, he and Alec taking the front while Ava held the rear. They then continued walking, trudging through the sand. It wasn't long though before another worm was spotted from Dirk's side. This time though, Dirk had a good idea as to how to handle them. He took out his two spear halves, piecing them together before pointing down at the oncoming worm. Shick! Thrusting the weapon, Dirk buried it in the sand. There was a muffled scream as sand was kicked up. He had pinned the worm. He then equipped his hatchet while holding down the spear. Stepping closer, he brought the hatchet down on the worm that had flailed to the surface, killing it in one chop. Wow, you make it look so easy. Alex spoke as Dirk removed the spear and sheathed his hatchet. Dirk didn't respond, instead looking at the worm. Should we be harvesting anything from the worms? The worms? HM, maybe they're mana crystals. I don't know of anything else of value. All right. Nodding, Dirk bent down and looked through his mana sense. He could sense a dense bundle of earth mana right in the front where its head was. Taking a knife, he pierced between two of the shells of the carapace and dug around, eventually pulling out a small brown-orange marble. It looked like a small solid turd. Here. Cleaning it off, Dirk tossed it to Garrett. Garrett caught it before taking out the loot bag and throwing it in. Since the marbles were solid, as long as the flesh around them was wiped off, they wouldn't carry any horrible stench. With that, they left the body behind, continuing their march. Because monsters within dungeons didn't breed, they were spawned. Upon a monster's death, the dungeon would gradually decompose them until there was nothing left behind. This process took a long time though, so in the short term, bodies would stack. Sure enough, the group came around the occasional dead worm. Some worms were cut in half, others were mauled to death by several slashes, and some were stabbed cleanly. Their yellow blood seeped into the sand, leaving damp clumps and wafting odors. Unfortunately there were virtually no breezes or winds, so the smells lingered around for hours. The group walked for hours as the sun rose further up into the sky, coming across dozens of dune worms along the way that would hunt in groups. Many were handled by Dirk while Alec got used to killing them with a sword. Ava got plenty of action too as worms snuck around behind them. Since she had an axe, as long as she hit her mark, they would die quickly. 
Along the way, the entire group drank tons of water, especially Garrett who constantly sweat. Their water bags were constantly drained, causing them to take small breaks where Kazma would refill them. Using funnels, she would conjure water balls and dump them down into the bags. They continued like this for seven hours. At this point, it was already well past noon, and the sun lowered to the other horizon. It was here that the group found another marker that directed them toward the haven. However, they were still a little under ten miles away, so they decided to take a break at the marker. Sheesh! This heat is not okay. Garrett spoke as he dropped all the bags. The loot bag clanked with a few dozen mana crystals, the fruits of their labor. By now, his armor was thoroughly drenched in sweat. If it weren't for the fact that he was a body refiner, his legs would be giving out too. In fact, it was now Kazma who was doing the worst. Her legs were aching from all the hiking. Walking through the sand was fine for a while, but at a certain point it became laborious. She had reached that point a while ago, and she knew she would bear the consequences of this hike the next day. She was now wishing that she was a body refiner like every other person in the group. The only consolation was that she could bear the heat better than Garrett. We have plenty of time to recuperate. At night, the dune worms don't come out, so we won't have to worry about anything once the sun goes down. We can continue to the haven then. Alex spoke as he went to one of the bags, pulling out a blanket and sitting on it. The others agreed with his plan as they took a seat as well, letting their legs rest. Dirk watched as his group members slipped off their boots, dumping out little piles of sand. Seeing that, he wiggled his feet to see if there was any sand inside. He couldn't feel anything though. In fact, his boots were still very comfortable, his feet not suffering from anything like blisters or soreness. His mother really did do a good job with his gear. Pulling out blankets, everyone either took a seat or laid down. As they did, the sun continued to set. The sand gradually turned from orange to pink, and the temperature rapidly dropped. As they rested, there were only a few dune worms that came over to them. Dirk easily took care of these, and when night finally fell, there were no more threats. It was only when the cold set in that Alec finally stood up. The others got up with him, their legs sufficiently recovered. Since there was no more heat, Garrett took off his heat protection necklace before hoisting the bags. Like this, the group made the final trek to the haven. Upon arriving, they were surprised to only see a few groups of people who were camping out. Picking a spot, they also set up camp before going to sleep for the night. As Dirk completed his first day, in a secret area on the edges of the Horizon Empire, there was a tall mountain. This mountain stood among droves of tall trees. The temperature here was tropic, meaning tons of various wild animals prospered in this lush jungle, and rain fell often. On this mountain there was a secret of entrance that led down into a series of caves. These caves were all man-made and surprisingly large, able to fit the same amount of people as a regular town. There were stone buildings everywhere, and between these buildings there were many adults and children who walked to and from. However, even disregarding the fact that it was within a mountain, this wasn't some normal town. All the children wore the same black clothes, and their heads were constantly lowered. They all looked either scared or apathetic. Both girls and boys alike, they were bruised, tired, but not weak. Their bodies sported tight muscles, none of them looking like normal kids. In their eyes were also sharp glints. Even the scared ones occasionally glanced around with acute senses. The adults were similarly special. Every single one gave off incredibly dangerous auras. In fact, those that didn't give off any aura were the ones the kids cowered the most near. The adults walked with trained steps, their violent gazes occasionally falling on the kids below them. Above them all though, there stood a man. From him, not even the adults could sense anything. This man wore a strip of cloth over his eyes. However, those he looked at could still feel a gaze on them, though they couldn't tell from where. This man was by no means blind, the way he utilized his senses being far beyond that of a normal person. The man stood within a room near the top of the mountain. He had one window that gave him a view of everything below, and another that gave him a view of the forest outside. 
his room was lit by ominous candles and decorated with bookshelves and odd paintings. Behind the man stood a younger woman who had a scar that ran from her eye socket back toward her ear. This woman glanced at the man with a bit of trepidation, mustering up courage before opening her mouth. He left not long ago. As you thought, his mother kept track of him. Of course she did. The man let out a deep sigh, the air in front of him whirling around from his powerful lungs. He scratched his graying beard. She probably has a feeling, though she doesn't want to believe it. Is the scout on him? Yes. He'll follow them to their destination and back. His last transmission told us that he would be gone for around two weeks. Good. Although he's following him to evaluate his ability, I don't believe there's any need to. The man narrowed his eyes before turning around to a desk, taking a seat and a leather chair. Unlike that woman's other children, this one is almost too good to be true. Determination, discipline, and his skill set is perfect. I couldn't imagine a more suitable candidate. This little adventure of his will only show us his current combat ability, and whether or not he has a talent for killing, which I believe he does. Yes. But sir, his mother is a tier 6. Sure she hasn't reached into tier 7 yet but her killing ability is no less than one with her rank. After all, you taught her. The young woman drifted off as the man's gaze fell on her. His eyes were covered, but she still couldn't help but cower as she felt that piercing gaze through the cloth. I know. However, that's precisely why I'm doing what I am. She knows that the day will come. That's why she pays so much attention to that amazing son of hers. She knows that her talent was passed to him and yet she hopes that he won't be subject to what she was. That's always been her weakness. Friendship and familial bonds. Compassion and a love for others. It could be said that I'm touching a reverse scale. But that's exactly why I'm going to handle this personally. The man lowered his head, slightly complicated emotions brewing in his mind. The next moment though, he seemed to radiate a sense of wrath. I will have another weapon, one that I will sharpen and hone to absolute perfection. He will surpass even his mother. And she can do nothing, because her weakness prevented her from surpassing her teacher. This is her own fault. And to think she thought she could escape her past. Marrying a measly Marquis? You think becoming friends with a duke will protect your family? Nobody escapes me. Nobody escapes my fallen azures. Bang! His fist raised and fell, slamming the table in front of him. The young woman in front of him backed away hastily as the table partially disintegrated under an oppressive power of darkness. Realizing he lost his cool, the man took a few deep breaths. He faced the young woman. When the time comes, bring him to me, the child named Dirk Strider. He will become a weapon, an agent of necessary chaos. A new era is dawning, and those like him will be the harbingers of revolution. Chapter 52 Fire Skink The next morning, Dirk was quick to wake up. He woke up even earlier than the few other groups who were camping in the haven. Deciding to enjoy a refreshing morning, he left the haven and stepped outside. In just his plain cloth clothes, he felt the slightest chilling breeze, cold sand between his toes, and smelled the stagnant, dry air. On the horizon, the sun was only barely starting to rise. From here, it would only get warmer until those blistering heat waves returned. Dirk stood there for around an hour, employing his mana lungs. He breathed in and out the ambient mana just like normal breathing. He barely felt the slightest drain on his mental energy. This signified his ever-increasing proficiency and rising tear. It wouldn't be long until his mana heart would be finished, he believed that by then, he would really be able to use mana lungs like normal lungs. As he was enjoying his little euphoric training session though, he was suddenly interrupted by wiggling in the sand. Opening his eyes, he saw the body of a dune worm surface from below the sand. Its long teeth raised into the air, its carapace gleaming under the rising sun. It didn't seem to notice Dirk though, who stood there with statue-like stillness. Seeing that the worm was oblivious to him, he had a thought and smiled. Activating a bit of the anima in his body, he broke out into a sudden sprint, appearing beside the worm before it could react. 
Then, bringing his leg back, he swung at it with a kick. His foot slammed against the worm's carapace, slightly cracking it. The force pulled the worm's three-foot-long body out of the sand and sent it flying like a ball. Dirk smiled as the worm flew for almost 130 feet, finally landing with a whimpering squeal. He, goal! Dirk chuckled as he cheered to himself. Looking at the worm that writhed around in pain, he smirked. These worms were actually incredibly easy to kill for him. The others, like Alec, had a more difficult time than him. They couldn't accurately find the worms when they slithered under the sand, and when they popped out, they didn't have the reaction times to kill it before it either bit them or slammed into them. Luckily they had their armor, making up for their seriously lacking combat experience. Otherwise, Alec and even Ava would have broken legs. Dirk couldn't blame them though. He often forgot, but they were all only teenagers at 13 years old. The fact that they were doing these kinds of things was already surprising enough. He couldn't expect them to automatically have exceptional skills. However, he also couldn't help but feel a little stifled. If he were by himself, he may very well likely be able to complete this job at the same pace, if not faster than the group. But he wasn't by himself, and it had subconsciously become his responsibility to ensure each person's safety. Thus, he had to move at their pace. But he didn't mind this so much. After living for so many years as a child, Dirk had become used to the slower lifestyle he had now. It was rather carefree, and he didn't have death constantly looming over his shoulder. It wasn't so serious and critical, and he could take his time with things. While he still trained himself to his limits and never slacked, it could be said that he was becoming a bit complacent. But Dirk knew that this complacency was temporary. If he so needed to, he could operate as he did in his previous life. Only, there was no need to. Dirk had no threats or enemies. His only goals and challenges were in the form of training his mana and body and academics, like forging and enchanting. He knew that there was a wider world out there, but he didn't necessarily feel the need to rush into it. Instead, he felt like enjoying where he was now. He had more than enough experience with war, international politics, and living a life of constant battles. Others who had never seen the things he has might be eager to engage in that lifestyle. But him? For the first time, he could enjoy himself and others. He wasn't so quick to throw that away. Cause once he did, he knew he might never be able to go back. Various thoughts rushed through his head. It was only a few seconds though before he shook it, bringing his gaze back to the worm that was beginning to dive under the sand again. Waving his hand, a magic circle appeared. A single spike manifested next to his head. It was an earth spike, but unlike before, it had hints of metal in it. This was the effect of his mana heart becoming more solid and the metal element exposing its power. Dirk had been told that this metal element would come to strengthen his earth spells to a great degree in the future, but it was only now that he got hints of it taking effect. Pointing his hand, Dirk sent the spike flying. It zipped over to the dune worm before nailing through its carapace and planting itself in its body. The dune worm thrashed as blood spilled, and even though it hadn't died, Dirk turned around to leave. As he walked back into the haven, the worm's death throes quieted before it eventually went still. When he walked back to the camp, Dirk was surprised to see Ava up. The two glanced at each other before Ava turned away with a neutral face, as if he were a stranger. Thinking back to his morning rumination, Dirk sighed before walking up to her. Good morning. Ah. Uh -huh. Dirk's mood worsened as Ava barely hummed in response. He had finally caved and spoke to her first, and that was what he got. Taking a breath, he calmed before continuing. I want to apologize. He got straight to the point, causing Ava to be quiet and listen. She stood in front of him, gazing out into the distance but he knew she was listening, waiting for what he had to say. Dirk thought back to his conversation with Alec prior to leaving. I'm sorry for speaking how I did to you. I didn't realize that you might have your feelings hurt. All right. Thanks. I can try to refrain from raising my voice in the future. It was only that I wanted to make sure you had understood what I was saying. Huh. Wait, hang on. 
what exactly are you apologizing for? Stopping him, Ava questioned. He looked at her oddly. For raising my voice. Talking how I did to you which made you mad. Raising your voice? That's what you thought this was about? Suddenly, Ava burst with hostility. Dirk's face fell as he realized he misunderstood something. Dirk, you've yelled at me before. You've punched and driven me into the ground. I've bled from wounds that you've caused. And you think talking a bit sternly to me was what hurt my feelings? Dirk frowned as Ava shouted. What she said made sense. But then what the hell was wrong? He hated this. Ava was getting mad at him, and he didn't know for what. What did he do wrong? He's done nothing but help her and care for her well-being, and then she goes and gets mad at him? As anger welled up within him, he opened his mouth. So? What is it? What did I do? I don't know what you want from me. Dirk, you dash. Ava was about to go off again when, in the corner of her eye, she saw one of the other parties climb out of their tents. Realizing that they were probably being too loud, she turned back to Dirk with a sigh. Dirk? Never mind. We'll talk about this later. She turned and climbed back into her tent, preparing her back. As she did so, Dirk stood outside, anger still flooding his chest. He wanted to grab her and force an answer out of her, but he restrained himself. That didn't stop Dark Mana from congealing around his fingers though. Feeling his Dark Mana move, Dirk looked down at his hand. Last time when he had first gotten mad, this Dark Mana had turned into claws. Then, he hadn't been in the right mind to care about this weird reaction. But now, in the midst of anger, he found himself wondering. Using his unyielding discipline, he closed his eyes and walked away, calming his mind. He then looked at his hands with apathy. The dark mana thin as his mind calmed, receding back into his body. This caused him to think. Does the dark mana become active with anger? Geralt had spoken about how emotion could spur the dark mana to move, as if it worked off of emotion. It seems like he wasn't wrong. For some reason, my dark mana only seems to want to come out when I'm emotional. Dirk came to this conclusion. He didn't know why, but emotion and dark mana had a link. Maybe this was why Geralt was so volatile and emotional himself. In order to become a great dark mage, one would have to be an emotional person, as that would ensure the easiest employment of their dark mana. But weren't his mother and sister dark mages? They didn't seem that emotional, especially not like Geralt. Or maybe they just weren't emotional around him. Dirk hadn't seen Rita much since she had entered the academy, and he had never seen his mother in action. But this led Dirk to think about something else. During his first kill initiation, he had lost himself in the desire to kill the goblin. He had such an overwhelming bloodlust, and it was so out of nowhere that Dirk only regained control of himself after the goblin was stabbed through the head. He had heard a voice beckoning him to draw blood, to end the goblin's filthy life. It was unlike anything he had felt before. This led him to believe that something about him was different. Seeing how Dark Manor reacted with emotion, he felt that it might also influence emotion. Was Geralt able to become a great dark mage because he was crazy, or did the dark mana make him crazy? Maybe it was both. But Dirk feared the latter. For now, he assumed that the dark mana influenced his emotion, and that he needed to be careful. It wasn't a good thing to get lost in emotion. Dirk had learned that long ago. In an intense battle, that could get you killed. Coming to that conclusion, Dirk shook his head. The dark mana on his hand fully dissipated, so he put it down and went to his tent. All right, looks like we're finally here. Now comes the hard part. Alex spoke as he stepped onto flat, solid ground. Behind him were the sand dunes, and in front was the second half of the dungeon. The group had already left the haven. After exiting, they walked forward for an hour before reaching the halfway point where the desert became flat. This was about five miles from the previous haven. They had faced several dune worms, but all of them were dispatched with ease. Now, they didn't see any more, but this wasn't comforting. Now, they would have to fight the hard enemies. Alec looked around. 
There were scattered boulders, large holes in the ground, brown bushes, and rough dirt. Seeing the various visual obstacles, Dirk realized this could be much more dangerous than he thought. All these boulders and holes and bushes were places for these skinks to hide and ambush them. They wouldn't be able to see one from far away. The others didn't really have these thoughts. They were only thinking about how the skinks could spit fire, and that they needed to keep their eyes peeled. Alex spoke after they walked onto the flat land. We need to get to the next haven, and that's about 30 miles away. We should get there by nightfall. Unlike the dune worms, the skinks don't totally hide away. They're still a threat, and we won't be able to see them well at night. So we should try and move quickly. Thankfully the ground is flat, so we can at least walk faster. He spoke as he stepped forward. In the distance he could see heat waves, and the hot ground warmed his souls. If it weren't for his fire attribute, he would be struggling in this heat. This caused him to look at Garrett. Luckily, since Garrett trained Anima, his body was at least tougher. That combined with the heat mitigation necklace made everything bearable. It was only Kazma who complained about sore legs and feet. Unfortunately, she could only bear it and move forward. This was the labor a mage had to be willing to bear until they learned higher level magic. The group carefully moved forward, Ava, Alec, and Dirk surrounding Garrett and Kazma in a triangle formation. Before leaving, Dirk had equipped every part of his armor. The dark gray metal and black leather was a stark contrast to the surrounding orange desert. Dirk's eyes scanned the surroundings from under his hood. He had even equipped the mask. The reason was because of the enemies he would be facing. The skinks could spit fire, and although he trusted his senses, he didn't want to get caught off guard and get burns. He was an assassin prowling in the open desert while the bright sun beamed down. It almost looked ridiculous, but he couldn't care less. He was alert as he kept his eyes peeled, taking in every detail. Enemy detected. Suddenly, Dirk was alerted. His AI highlighted a bush, outlining the silhouette of something behind it. This was yet another useful feature of the AI. It could take in the most minute details, and in cases where something was camouflaged, it would pick out the abnormalities. The result was an enemy detection. Dirk looked at the bush that was 30 meters away. Nothing was moving, but it didn't matter that he couldn't tell if there was something behind it. He stepped forward and extended his hand, grabbing Alec's shoulder. Hmm. Alec turned around and looked at Dirk. Dirk put his finger over his mouth, and seeing this, the group stopped. He then grabbed his bow, taking an arrow out of a quiver. Knocking the arrow, he pulled back. The string took rather substantial force to draw. The arrow was also tipped with some kind of metal Dirk was unfamiliar with. Nonetheless, Cecilia had assured Drick that the bow was quality, so he decided to trust her. He aimed at the bush that still maintained its stillness. Once he was lined up, he loosed the arrow. The arrow was almost entirely silent as it sailed across the thirty meters in an instant. Screech! Suddenly, as the arrow buried itself in the bush, a scream was heard. A fire skink raised its head as it howled. The arrow had pierced its abdomen. The others in the group were surprised. They hadn't even seen the skink. Should they have kept walking, they would have been taken by surprise. Someone would have been burned. But Dirk spotted the skink in time. He saved them a bad injury. Knowing that it had been caught, the skink screamed more and charged the group. It was shockingly fast as it traversed the ground with its long and sharp claws, leaving gouges in the dirt. Seeing how fast it was, Dirk realized he wouldn't even have enough time to draw another arrow. He threw his bow to the side, taking out his hatchet. He couldn't even use his spear since its two pieces had to be attached. Alec also drew his sword while Ava rushed to the front. But they were too late. The skink threw itself at Dirk who stood in front. Its mouth opened, and he could see a flame billow out of it. However, he didn't dodge to the sides or duck behind his armor. Instead, he proceeded to throw himself at the skink, diving out with his hand. Just as the fire was going to escape the skink's mouth, Dirk's two hands grabbed its upper and lower jaws. 
activating the anima in his body, his arms erupted with tyrannical strength. He yanked the skink to the side, pointing its mouth in another direction and totally diverting its aim. The fire was spit out, a long tongue of flame shooting out a few meters and igniting several other bushes. The skink started thrashing about when it was finished with its fire attack, but with Dirk's hand grabbing its jaws, there wasn't much it could do. The skink wasn't even in control of its body as Dirk slammed its mouth shut and pinned its head to the floor. After freeing up a hand, he equipped and brought down his hatchet. Splat! The hatchet plowed into the skink's spine. Its entire body immediately fell limp, its claws no longer able to thrash around. Dirk left the hatchet in the lizard as he expertly unsheathed a knife, bringing it around to its head. Slice! The knife pierced its eye socket, digging to its brain. The violent resistance faded from the skink's other eye, succumbing to the call of death. He then let go of the skink's jaw. As his hand relaxed, he could feel the shattered bone underneath his fingers. His gripped strength had broken the skink's jaw. Alex stood to the side as Dirk removed his weapons, cleaning off the hatchet before shaking it. As always, Dirk made it seem so easy to kill these monsters. But he knew that he wouldn't be able to copy him. After cleaning the hatchet, Dirk kept his knife and scanned around the skink. He could detect a dense fire mana source in its neck. This was the mana crystal and the source of the skink's power. Cutting through the rough flesh, Dirk dug around before plucking out a hot stone. This stone was bright red and the size of a marble. Only 139 to go. Saying that, he stood up and tossed the stone to Garrett, who hastily caught it and dumped it in the loot bag. This was their job item, a fire mana crystal. They only needed 140 of these red marbles to complete what they came here for. After hearing him though, Alec frowned. He had a hard time imagining his group getting through this in one piece and without injury. He was also thinking that 170 gold wasn't nearly enough for everything they were doing. They had already spent quite a bit, and after dividing it among everyone, it may only barely cover expenses. It was a very small profit margin. But unless they completed the job, they wouldn't get anything. Although Alec had never worried about money in his entire life, he didn't feel good about taking a loss. This was even more so for those like Garrett and Kazma who didn't have the backing he did. They were barely able to get the armor and weapons they had. It was now up to them to use those to make money for themselves and their families. Chapter 53 Challenge After Dirk killed the first fire skink, the group continued walking. This time, they were quite a bit slower, their eyes warily staring at bushes that skinks could be hiding behind. However, around ten minutes after their first kill, they encountered another skink. As they walked across the desert with their weapons drawn, a pair of eyes gazed at them from within a large hole. The head was quick to sink back down though, not exposing itself and waiting for the right time to strike. Dirk was constantly scanning around, his AI sending him any important updates like recent track marks and such. He knew that a skink could come from anywhere, and he was actually most worried about all the fox holes. He couldn't see into these until he was close, so it would be close calls. Unfortunately, such an event was unavoidable. As the group got closer, the skink primed itself to fight. Its body heat up and prepared its fire spit. However, this was a slight giveaway. Abnormal heat fluctuations detected. Dirk's AI gave him an alert, and his head snapped to the heat source. However, Alec was the closest one to it. He also seemed to feel something odd as he looked down. Enemy in the hole! Dirk shouted, but it was too late. Alec's head barely turned to see a bright tongue of flame streaming toward him. He instinctively raised his arms. Ack! Alec yelled as the heat crashed into him, igniting his armor. He was like Dirk and also covered from head to toe. This naturally made him very safe against all forms of attack. However, his face wasn't covered, and flames slipped through his defenses. The flames covered his front side, and the skink wasted no time in charging. It launched out of the hole and jumped at Alec. Its claws grabbed at his armor and its weight threw the disoriented boy off balance. 
They went tumbling to the ground as the skink madly slashed at his body, its nails attempting to rip at the tough leather. Alec panicked under the sudden bombardment. He covered his face as he tried kicking off the skink, even throwing some punches to get it off and do damage. But his strength was limited, and the skink just stayed on top of him. Luckily, he had someone reliable on his team. There was a sudden stop to the skink's attacks as it raised its head. In front of it was Dirk with his hatchet, and it had no time to react before the blade came slashing down. Splat! The hand axe buried itself into the skink's head. Its body instantly went limp on top of Alec, and Dirk kicked the skink corpse off of him. Alec looked up at his savior, sighing in relief. I may have to start counting the number of times I owe you for saving me. He spoke with a smile, climbing back to his feet. He didn't find it amusing, but he was beginning to get used to the sudden attacks and Dirk saving him. Dirk just smirked before harvesting the skink, plucking out another red marble. As he did so, Alec activated some of his light magic. He had high fire resistance as a fire attribute mage, so the fire the skink spit out didn't do too much besides singe some of the hair on his eyebrows and skin on his cheek. Besides the hair, there was nothing he couldn't heal. As for his armor, it held strong, worthy of the large sum of money his parents had spent on it. Dirk tossed the fireman a crystal to Garrett after plucking it, and the group began their walk again. Unfortunately, their encounters only increased. They came across a few more single skinks, Dirk usually spotting them and taking preemptive action. There was only one that caught them by surprise, and it was actually Ava who fell victim to the ambush. However, she was able to handle it better than Alec. Her martial arts training kicked in as the skink jumped on her, and she was able to kick the skink away before wielding her axe and chopping it. It took her three chops to kill it, and this actually resulted in the skink being separated into two halves. Everyone backed away as pools of blood flowed. All except for Dirk who harvested like he always did. After that, they began to encounter groups. Dungeons always got more difficult as one went deeper, and this was shown in two ways. The first was an increased amount of enemies. The second was the higher strength of the monster. Most people would have to take things slowly. They would skirt around the edges of a monster territory, only seeking out single monsters. Then, they would slowly work their way in toward groups of two. If they encountered a group of three, they would back out. But Dirk's group wasn't most people. Himself, Ava, and Alec were at the top of their class, and this class was within the academy. It was a school that regularly produced strong mages and warriors, and even the younger teens would be able to match the majority of adults in pure strength. This was because if one didn't come from the academy, it was unlikely that they had real talent. So young teens of the academy often pushed forward, doing their best to kill as many monsters as possible. They would only continue to grow as they killed more, so they didn't hesitate to. Plus, they desired money, so they were driven to complete jobs regularly. Dirk's group wasn't necessarily like this. Alec was cautious, as were Garrett and Kazma. These three were constantly worried about getting into a situation that would end badly. However, Dirk and Ava weren't worried. Despite them being mad at each other, Ava knew just how powerful Dirk was. She didn't have the slightest worry that they wouldn't leave this dungeon alive. Dirk had also shown Alec just how capable he was, so this encouraged him. He didn't mind taking the risk since he knew that Dirk would likely handle anything that went out of control. He did this perfectly in the Gremlin dungeon. So the group continued forward, their only concern whether or not they were going to make it to the next haven before sundown. However, despite their relative ease, Dirk was the one who was most concerned. If they encountered more groups, or bigger groups, he may not be able to protect everyone. He could kill quickly, but in the time that he was distracted, those skinks could set others ablaze. They merely had to spit once, and things could get nasty. This was especially so for Garrett and Kazma. They were the weakest links, something that caused Dirk's mood to worsen throughout the hours of hiking. Dirk had the urge to remove these group members of his seeing as how they never stepped forward to kill anything. He had the strong desire to be alone, or at least rid himself of these incompetent people. Even if it meant carrying a bag, 
he was willing to do it if it meant he could move quickly and efficiently. He felt slight anger arise within him whenever Kazma complained about her feet or when Garrett complained about his sweat-soaked clothes. He almost wanted to put them in front to fight the skinks, just so they would finally contribute to this expedition. But he didn't. He just stayed silent as they continued to traverse this unforgivable wasteland. And upon finally encountering a group of four skinks, Dirk decided to vent his anger. Ha! After spotting a skink, Dirk violently equipped his hatchet and charged. Alec and Ava did the same, each diving on a skink. After fighting enough, they had come to learn that taking the fight to the skink was the best way to stay safe. Dirk raised his arm, throwing the hatchet at the skink. The hatchet spun toward it, the blade landing on its body. The skink screamed in pain and spit fire, but Dirk had learned a new way to protect himself. Raising his hand, a shield of stone suddenly manifested in front of him. This disc blocked all the flame, the surface being damaged. After the fire dissipated though, Dirk tossed it away, continuing his charge. Seeing him charge, the skink rushed to meet him. It ran over with the axe in its body, raising its claws to slash Dirk. However, he didn't back away as he clenched his fist. Anima flooded his body and strengthened his muscles, and he punched out with unstoppable force. Crunch! The fist landed on the skink's skull, instantly caving it in. Blood splashed as the skink flattened against the floor. Against a tier 3 skink, Dirk's rank 3 strength was more than enough to instantly kill it barehanded. Dirk's body then swung around, facing the others. Alec and Ava were brought into their own battles. Ava had developed her own trick where she would toss a water ball into the mouth of the skink, both blocking its fire and damaging it with the subsequent explosion. Alec though came up with a more brutish method where he would literally fight fire with fire. The flames of his and the skinks would clash, his usually winning and slightly burning the skin of the skink. He would then go in with his sword, slashing it until it died. Of course, Garrett and Kazma stood to the side, Garrett protecting the bags and Kazma staying out of the way. However, with four skinks, they were now in danger. The fourth skink went around, facing its unoccupied prey. Kazma and Garrett backed away but couldn't outrun the skink. The skink charged them, opening its mouth to fire. Luckily, Kazma had at least learned from those in front of her. Summoning five water balls, she flung them all toward the skink. The skink screamed as one of the balls was hurled into its mouth, exploding. The others also exploded around it, dealing damage. But it didn't kill it. Enraged, the skink shook off the building pane and charged them again. This time, it lunged at them with its claws. Kazma panicked. She knew that if she got scratched, it would leave large wounds. She feared the pain and cowered away, stumbling backwards. The next moment though, a leg came swinging in front of her. The skink that was lunging toward her was slammed away, its body flying for thirty meters and tumbling ten more. Kasma looked at Dirk who had punted the skink, sighing in relief. Dirk didn't spare her a look as he glared at the skink he kicked. It now had a giant dent in its skull and lay limp on the ground. He likely shattered all the bones in its head. He could even feel the crunch on his leg as he kicked. Nodding, he turned his attention to the others. Luckily, he wouldn't have to expend more energy. Ava quickly chopped her skink into pieces while Alec planted his sword in the skink's body, killing it. They steadied themselves with blood splattered across their legs. Dirk sighed as they finished, proceeding to harvest the mana crystals. Sheesh! That was close. Garrett sighed as the others settled down. Alec nodded in agreement, but Dirk let out a slight huff. Dirk plucked out the mana crystals from the four skinks. Walking over to Garrett, he didn't bother handing it to him as he snatched the bag and dropped in the crystals himself. Now, they had gathered about eighteen. The next moment, Dirk looked at the sun. It had been several hours since they started the day, already well past noon. In a few more hours, the sun would set. Dirk spoke as he tossed the bag back to Garrett. We're a bit over halfway to the haven, but we only have around four hours until sunset. And going at the rate we are, we will need at least a week to gather enough crystals. We're only halfway. 
Seriously? Garrett blurted out at Dirk's assessment. Hearing this complaint, Dirk only turned to the boy. Garrett saw those almost apathetic eyes and shrunk back a bit. He wasn't sure, but over time, he had realized that Dirk might not be totally happy with his presence. He wisely decided to go quiet. Seeing this, Dirk turned away. Garrett and Kazma were the reasons they were moving slower. He got annoyed at them who kept complaining when they had no right to. Alex spoke up. Should we turn back? We're already halfway. The only reason we should is if you all can't handle fighting in the night. I don't think we can. Alex sighed. Not only will we have to fight at night, but the monsters are getting more plentiful and stronger. We can handle a couple at night, but not that many. I think we should go back. Then let's get going. As if he didn't care, Dirk turned and started walking. He agreed with Alec, but only in that they couldn't handle it. He was almost certain Garrett and Kazma would come out of the night burned to a crisp. As the sun started going down, the skinks retreated into their dens. This meant that the group came across fewer skinks as they walked back the way they came. However, the ones they did come across almost always came out of a fox hole, making it a rather thrilling hike full of surprises. Under Dirk's watch though, nobody got hurt. The only thing they had to deal with was the rapidly dropping temperatures after the sun went down. They had to walk in this frigid cold for a few hours before finally reaching the haven. The group was quick to pitch their tents and cuddle under their blankets upon entering the stone fortress, heading fast to sleep. The next morning, the group woke up a bit later than usual. This marked their third day inside the dungeon, and in total the fifth day since they left the capital city. After going through their morning routine, the group left the haven and began their normal hike deep into skink territory. Because of the direction they took that headed straight for the deepest haven, they almost never encountered other groups as very few intended to head there. And if they did, there was usually a tacit agreement to just maintain distance, the two parties keeping their separate paths. This allowed them to fight more skinks. However, on this day, they found fewer skinks than usual. It wasn't much less, but by the time they reach halfway into the day, they had only collected six mana crystals. Alec didn't really notice this fact though. He continued to lead the group into skink territory until they reached the time to make a decision. With Dirk as his clock, he realized that they were in the same dilemma as last time. They could try to push to the farthest haven, but that meant they would fight at night. While he had learned that the skinks retreated into their fox holes at night, he knew this was actually more dangerous than normal. Their previous night had been one of several ambushes, and it wouldn't have gone as well if they were to have pushed forward. Knowing this, he decided that it was best if they just didn't try to go to the farthest haven and turned around. The group was okay with his reasoning and followed. Dirk also didn't particularly care. They retreated all the way back to the haven, gaining another six mana crystals for a grand total of twelve that day. However, come the next day, Dirk began to notice something. On the fourth day, the group headed out like normal. They hiked through the dry desert dirt and bushes, fighting any skinks they came across. Alec then turned around at the halfway point and retreated, heading back to the haven where the group rested for the night. However, come the day's end, Dirk counted the crystals they had collected. The amount was ten, two less than the day before. The fifth day, Dirk counted the crystals at night again, coming up with nine. The amount they gained per day was decreasing. This was half of what they had gotten on the second day. They now had 49 crystals, and needed 91 more. At a pace of nine a day, they would need 10 days, and this was if the amount per day didn't continue to decline. Dirk waited to bring this up, going into the next day to see if things would get worse. And sure enough, when the sixth day came to a close, Dirk counted only seven crystals. The skinks were declining in population, obviously due to them. Finally, Dirk brought this up to Alec. Alec had also started to notice. Only encountering seven skinks through the entire day was alarming. And upon discussing it, he grew even more concerned. We need to change things up. Alec spoke. Right now, he and the group were gathered around their tents, eating rations. These rations were in fact some of their last ones. 
they would run out the day after tomorrow, forcing them to resort to eating skink meat. They pushed this concern to the back of their mind though as they listened into Alec. The number of mana crystals were getting decreases by the day. If this keeps up, we won't be able to reach 140 fast enough. I had originally planned for around 20 days, but I don't think any of us want to drag this out that long. So, if we want to move quicker we need to change what we're doing. We have two options. Alec put up two fingers. We can either search around other areas of the dungeon, or we can go deeper. However, I don't know if the first option is that viable. Why not? Garrett questioned, prompting Alec to speak in a low voice. The other groups. They have their own areas that they hunt in every day. We've claimed our own area too. If we start searching around, we'll be taking their kills. I was taught about these kinds of things, and I'm starting to realize that there are unwritten rules in dungeons. If we want to keep away from conflict, we can't encroach on other people's hunting zones. Alex spoke from the inferences he had collected over the past several days. Hearing him, Dirk thought about it and nodded. There were four other groups besides them in the haven, totaling five. They always ventured off in the direction of the farthest haven, while the others walked in their own directions. This formed zones where the groups would stick to, ensuring that they could all get kills and crystals. They had luckily stuck to their routine path, otherwise they may have gotten into a fight with another group. But this posed a problem. Their own zone was dwindling in skink numbers. After all, they killed everyone they came across. They needed a way to make up for this. With the other groups there, their only option now was to go deeper. So we need to go to the deepest haven. Ava spoke as the group made this conclusion. Alec nodded. It's our only option, unless we want to fight people. But going to the deepest haven won't be easy. Unless we pick up our pace, we won't get there before the sun sets. This means we'll have to fight a good amount of skinks in the night. Those skinks are stronger and more plentiful than the ones around here. I'm honestly not sure how well we can handle it. Alec went quiet. The group lowered their heads in contemplation. It was a risk, and they had to decide if they were going to take it. For the sake of completing their job faster, did they want to take on this challenge? Dirk looked around at everyone's pondering faces. If it were him, he would have been there already. But with the two pieces of baggage known as Garrett and Kazma, they were being held back. He figured they wouldn't want to take the risk since they had the highest chances of getting hurt. However, what they said surprised him. I think we should go. Garrett spoke up first with a smile. I'm tired of this heat, so if we can complete this job faster, we should. Hmm. I'm with him. Kasma nodded, feeling the same way as Garrett. She was building up fatigue every day, pushing her legs to their limits just to keep up with the group. She didn't want to stay here for a day longer. Plus, in the dungeon, while they had water, they weren't exactly able to shower or clean up much. Nobody was feeling clean or comfortable. It was a miracle they had stayed inside for as long as they did. Very well then. Our next goal is the deepest haven. However, I think we should exit the dungeon first. We're running out of rations, and we could use a day of rest to make sure we're in top shape. Yes. I like that idea. Garrett cheered at Alec's suggestion. Ava and Kazma also nodded. They wouldn't mind taking a day or two off at all. With that, the decision was made. The group left the haven the next morning, making their way out of the dungeon and back to civilization. Chapter 54 Normal Dirk's group exited the dungeon and basked in the cool, fresh air. Without wasting time, they made their way to an inn. It was already dark out since it had taken the whole day to cross the sand dunes to the exit, so not only were they tired, but dirty with sand in their clothes. Two rooms for two nights please. Alec paid for the inn, and upon getting the keys, the group rushed to their rooms. The girls shot toward the baths, as did Alec and Garrett. Dirk saw their eagerness and shook his head. Because of his body refining, he almost never sweat even under strenuous conditions. His skin didn't release many oils and dead skin wasn't any longer a thing. 
he felt about as fresh as the first day he stepped into the dungeon. The only thing he needed to wipe off was the small amount of sand that dusted his face. Other than that, he could be said to be perfectly clean. Not even other body refiners could maintain cleanliness for so long. This was a perk afforded to Dirk who had undergone skin destruction. His skin and hair were resilient and wouldn't dirty for long periods of time. Plus, his body was more resistant to changes such as temperature, so only if he pushed himself to his limit would he sweat and become dirty. Because of this, he didn't particularly need to shower. It would only be a matter of comfort. That night, everyone went to bed with a smile on their face. All except Dirk. Because they were planning on spending a few days outside of the dungeon, he decided to practice his enchanting. Specifically, the rune that he would need to plant onto his mana heart. This rune was a couple of steps above anything he had ever seen. Luckily, the book was detailed in its description about how to create it, so he merely needed to practice. It would take a while to successfully form, but it would happen. That night, he spent a few hours messing around. Using earth and metal mana, he drew runes in the air continuously. The rune he needed to make was comprised of many smaller runes that would both fuse together and cooperate together. Some runes oversaw the timing of the heart compressions, while others tracked the beat rate of the physical heart. Others would draw on the power of the mana heart to fuel the rune while some would monitor the cycling of mana through the blood. It was a surprisingly complex rune that ensured not only the beating of the mana heart, but its symbiosis with the physical heart. There were even some runes that laid the foundation for heart fusion in the future. These were easily the hardest ones to form. For him who had only just formed the most basic rune recently, all of this was exceptionally difficult. In the few hours that Dirk worked on it, he had failed nearly every rune he formed. There were dozens he needed to learn and form, but only one was successfully created. This was the easiest rune too. Naturally, it would take a long while to make all of them. But he advanced rapidly. While he may have failed almost all of them, he had gained many little pieces of knowledge that laid a strong foundation for enchanting. Usually, enchanters in training would be given systematic teachings in order to bring them up step by step. But he was jumping straight to the top, and by filling the gaps in himself, he was able to increase his natural ingenuity and attunement for enchanting. While it may not be the most conventional way to learn, introducing inconsistencies into one's general knowledge, it was definitely an effective practice for those that could actually make progress. Besides, the mana heart technique was one of the greatest techniques in the world. Naturally, the runes created by the technique's creator wouldn't be garbage. That person may have been one of the greatest enchanters of their time. Only someone that smart could create such a technique. If Dirk could form those runes, he could be said to be proficient in enchanting. Dirk had no qualms about how he went about things. He practiced until it got late, after which he finally decided to go to sleep. The next morning, everyone was slow to wake up. Because this was a day off, they indulged in their dreams until late in the morning. Dirk, naturally, wasn't one of those. He woke up bright and early. Despite going to bed late, he was refreshed as if he had gotten twelve hours of sleep. If he were on earth, he wouldn't be so energetic. But because he had trained mana, he could go without much sleep and still be well rested. After waking, he did a bit of mana long training as he dove into practicing the runes again. Because of his practice session last night, he had several ideas to try, and he was able to make even more progress than before. However, when noon came around and everyone woke up, he had only succeeded in forming one more rune. This was two out of dozens. He sighed at how long it would be before he completed everything. The group woke up and decided to get some food in a nearby restaurant. They congregated around a table and Alec ordered a whole platter to fill everyone up. Unfortunately, this cost more money, and the hopes for making any kind of profit from this job were dwindled down further. By this point though, Alec couldn't bother with that much. He had eventually shifted his mindset from making money to taking this trip as a way to gain experience. And surprisingly, he also had similar thoughts as Dirk when it came to Garrett and Kasma. Alec also felt that his porter and water mage didn't contribute much to this expedition. Over the week they had been inside the dungeon, 
Kasma had only been useful when it came to filling up their water bags. Only occasionally did she ever fight. All fighting had been left to Dirk, Alec, and Ava. However, Alec was different from Dirk in that he still accepted the value of a porter who could carry their luggage. Alec wasn't like Dirk who could so easily go with only a few items on him. He wanted his tent, his rations, blankets, and other necessities. This took up space, and if he had a bag to carry, it would inhibit his fighting ability to some extent. So, he appreciated having someone like Garrett. At the very least though, if Alec was able to stick with Dirk and Ava for another job, he would only bring a porter along. He didn't see a need for any more combat power as the three of them had proved to be more than enough. That day after eating, the group went and restocked on supplies. They bought enough rations to last them over a week as well as a few other convenient items. After that, they went to wander the town for a bit. Although this town wasn't nearly as glorious as the capital city, it was still a new place with new sights. Dirk and his group walked down a street in comfortable clothes. The only one armed was Dirk who carried a hidden knife strapped to his abdomen. They looked around, finding many street vendors who sold a myriad of items. Most of them sold food whose aroma and sizzling greasiness pleased the senses of passerby. Others pawned off some items they had found. These items were mostly mana crystals, skink leather, and dune worm teeth. There were even vials of blood that some collected. Ava saw this and dove into thought. Blood was mostly used in alchemy, and she had learned some about it. Other than that, there were those who sold jewelry and even some who sold weapons and armor. Anything that a dungeon diver would take a fancy to was here. After all, this town was founded around a dungeon. It naturally catered to dungeon divers who brought in the money. After walking around some, Garrett and Kazma decided that they would take their own walk around town. So far, Dirk was the only one who knew about their relationship. However, Alec and Ava had their guesses seeing their behavior over the week. Their splitting off from the group for privacy was another giveaway. This caused Ava to think though. For several minutes, she pondered in silence as her, Alec, and Dirk continued to explore. Eventually though, she lifted her head. Sorry Alec, but I need Dirk for a bit. Oh? Alec turned to her, surprised. Dirk was also surprised. Alec didn't mind though, merely smiling as if he knew what was going on. Don't worry, you two go ahead. Thanks. Ava's face reddened a bit as she grabbed Dirk's arm and walked off. Alec chuckled as he walked in a different direction. Dirk followed Ava who walked in silence for a while. Since she had pulled him away, he intended to let her speak first. And eventually, she opened her mouth. Um, do you know why I got mad? She asked weirdly as they walked beside each other. Dirk's mind started to move as he pondered the question. Up until now, he truly hadn't understood what the problem was. He had only refused her repayment. As a friend, she didn't need to pay him for gifts he gave her. That was it. Dirk was a straightforward person and a straightforward thinker. That's how he had been raised. Where he came from, there were no friendly relationships and hardly any emotion. The only good relationship he ever had was with a grown man who had been his superior but also a father figure. And even then, there weren't any fluffy things like feelings to be discussed. But although he hadn't had any sort of emotional development back then, he could still learn. His own mother had introduced a sense of compassion, a sense of likeness for another person. And as his first friend, Ava was the recipient of this newfound sense of affection. He took care of her when she needed it. His giving her potions to heal from wounds he gave her was an example of this. But perhaps it was the heightened emotional presence within him that caused him to think of other things. He wanted to take care of her, but she also wanted to take care of him. Their feelings were mutual, and rejecting one side would lead to either conflict or separation. Dirk had eventually thought of these things. Normally, he would have thought them to be crazy. After all, he had never had anyone who wanted to take care of him like this before. But now, in this new life where he had a loving mother, and now a caring friend, he figured that it wasn't so crazy. Dirk sighed after thinking of these things. 
At some point, the two had reached a more barren part of the town, so he stopped walking. Ava stopped with him and turned to him. I rejected your kindness. Dirk spoke, a tiny bit awkward. Your first potion was made for me. You spent time and effort to make it so you could help me. Sorry for not realizing it sooner. No, it's all right. Ava sighed, suddenly feeling bad. She knew Dirk and how he acted. This shouldn't have gotten her mad, but such blatant rejection from him made her feel like he didn't think of her as a friend. It felt more like he was paying a debt. As Dirk thought, they were friends. It was supposed to be a two-way relationship. Ava spoke these thoughts. Dirk, you've given me a lot. You gave me your expensive potions, let me use and stay in your house, training, food, and treatment. And I. I feel like a parasite. I've basically given you nothing. And I know you don't want me to repay you, but I do. I want to give you something at least as a thanks. Or I wanted to try. But. I can't make any of those good potions. Alchemy is hard, and I wasted so many materials just to make that bottle of crap. I just. I hate how there's nothing I can do in return. I mean, who needs anything from a useless deer girl who can't mix some stupid plant juices correctly? Ava's fingers clenched as the corner of her mouth twitched. Dirk was surprised she started degrading herself. How hard had she tried just to get that single potion? Now he was feeling even worse for rejecting her hard work. After a few moments of anger though, Ava let out a long breath. She closed her eyes and shook her head. I just... I'm not mad at you. I'm sorry. I didn't want to make you mad, but I was mad and an idiot. Oh God, I'm such a bitch. Excuse me? S sorry. My friends say that word, and I'm basically the embodiment of it right now. Ava sheepishly covered her face before massaging her temples. Seeing her stress, Dirk sighed himself. It looked like she was placing a lot of pressure on herself. He felt bad, but definitely not as bad as Ava who was heavy with regret and shame. Dirk opened his mouth to speak, but Ava beat him to the punch. Hey, I know you're probably still mad, but I'm sorry. I don't know why I got mad when I did. I was just, frustrated. It's fine. Dirk gave a small reassuring smile. Sure he was mad, but he now at least understood the situation. In this world, there were many like Ava who bore the pressure of their families and expectations. She was just another young girl trying to do her best, and Dirk's lack of supportive understanding caused her to blow up a bit, especially when he was the one she wanted support from the most. She cautiously looked up at him. Are you mad? I was. But I know I'm not the most, normal person to have as a friend. It's not your fault. I should have encouraged you. No. I mean, sure you're not totally normal, but you're not that weird. That weird? W8, not like that. I mean, you're different, but in a good way. You know, you're really strong, but you don't talk to, well, anyone. And that's not bad. It's just, you're not like Alec who everyone in the school is friends with because he's one of the strongest. But I don't care about that. You're perfect. I am not perfect. Dirk chuckled a bit. Being who he was, he naturally wasn't normal, and he never tried to convince himself that he was. But unfortunately for Ava, she had to put up with all his abnormalities. And while she liked him enough to do so, Dirk knew he could still frustrate her. Thinking of this, Dirk felt a bit crestfallen. He didn't enjoy frustrating his friend. He wanted to be more normal, but he had no idea what that meant or how to go about it. Seeing Dirk get a bit depressed, Ava became hasty. Hey, what's the frown for? Are we good now? Of course. Then let's hug. With enthusiasm, Ava rose up on her toes and wrapped her arms around Dirk. He felt the comfort of her embrace and couldn't help but hug back. The two stood there until Dirk raised his head and saw some other man who sneered at them from a short distance away. Dirk frowned and separated from Ava before pulling her arm and walking the opposite direction. He didn't want to be bothered when he was just now getting back in a good mood. 
Ava was confused as she was lead away, but after hearing a chuckle she turned her head and saw the same man. Realizing what happened, she also frowned. Unfortunately, it didn't seem like that man intended to let them be. Hey kid! The man shouted, causing Dirk to stop walking. He looked back at the man with a mean gaze. The man chuckled sarcastically. Oh no, so scary. What's your name, little boy? None of your business. Ah, come on now. I just want to get to know you better. Here, let me introduce myself and my friends. At that moment, two other people emerged from some alleyways behind them. Dirk's mind immediately went on high alert. Ava also realized something was happening. They were being targeted. I'm Gut, and these are Barsoul and Hurl. Hey kid, we've been a little tight on finances recently. You wouldn't happen to have any spare change, would you? Gut spoke as he stepped forward, exposing the point of a knife from a pocket. Dirk moved Ava behind him. Ava herself started to panic. Unfortunately, this was on the outskirts of the town. They had come here for some quiet, but that meant there wasn't any nearby help. Ava had fought people before, but she had never been in a disadvantaged position like this. She wouldn't know anything about fighting someone with a knife while barehanded. Her only solace was Dirk. When she looked at him, she could sense his emotions. His mind moved rapidly, but it was calm. His breathing didn't change, his heart rate didn't rise, and there were no outward signs of stress. The only thing she noticed was his gaze. It turned cold, apathetic. It was like he cared for nothing. It was like he turned into a puppet. Ava was slightly startled, but the slow, gradual approach of these robbers caught her attention. Seeing how Dirk didn't respond, Gut smirked. What's wrong little boy? We don't want to hurt you. We just need some money, and for you to never speak of this to anyone. How about it? Gut, I think he's too scared. He's paralyzed. The man Barsol chuckled as he saw Dirk's rigid body. The next moment though, Dirk's eyes turned to Gut. I'm not giving you anything. Turn around and walk away. Dirk spoke with a monotone voice. It didn't have a single hint of shakiness or commanding. It was as if he were merely informing them of a decision they had to make. Gut was surprised by his calm, but didn't think too much of it. He knew that Dirk Dungeon Dove, so he would naturally have some semblance of calm in the face of danger. He frowned at Dirk. Boy, don't push me. I'm sure you don't want anything to happen to that little girlfriend of yours. Gut took another step forward. Hearing him, Dirk felt anger well up within him. Kill him. An insidious voice echoed in Dirk's mind. He felt an urge, a sense of bloodlust. His hand twitched. Take out your money right now, and maybe I'll let you go. Gut moved even closer, coming within a few feet of Dirk. The other two also closed in, surrounding them. Ava shrunk back, feeling the anima inside her begin to activate. Being cornered like this, she felt her fight or flight response creep in. But Dirk didn't move, so she didn't either. Meanwhile, from afar, a pair of eyes watched this confrontation with curiosity. The eyes focused on Dirk and how he reacted. He, this kid isn't so bad. No wonder the big boss sent me to watch him. He's a real treat. Hopefully he can handle this little present I gave him. With a weird laugh, the pair of eyes hid away, moving to get a better view of the show. Chapter 55, Kill Dirk and Ava stood back to back. Ava waited for Dirk to do anything. She was surprised by the words that came out of his mouth the next moment. Touch her, and you will never see the light of day again. Dirk spoke with a frosty voice. Gut heard this bone-chilling statement, but instead of being intimidated, he got excited. Ha, ah, very well. Let's do it the fun way. With a maniacal laugh, Gut swung his knife. He only wanted to slash Dirk, hurting him, but not killing him. He wanted to see the fear on Dirk's face. It was easy to act tough, but all that broke down when one finally got a taste of real danger. Unfortunately, Dirk wasn't a normal kid. 
As the knife slashed through the air, threatening to slice his chest open, a voice spoke in his head. Engagement detected. Three threats determined. Killing order generated. Happy hunting. Slice. The knife came flying through the air. Gut frowned though when he didn't feel the familiar sensation of tearing flesh. He saw Dirk's body bend back, narrowly dodging the knife. The next moment, Dirk shot out his arm. His hand grabbed Gut's forearm that gripped the knife. Gut was about to rip his arm away when surprisingly, Dirk's grip remained firm. His hand was like a vice as it squeezed tighter and tighter. Dirk was activating his anima, and his strength rapidly increased. Arg! Gut growled as the pain became great. It felt like his arm was in the jaws of a monster. He jerked his body around, trying to escape his grip. He punched Dirk and even kicked, but was horrified to find out that Dirk's body was solid as a rock. Punching him hurt his own fist. He yelled, but was suddenly interrupted by a horrible noise. Crack! The forearm gave out, Dirk's hand clamping down. Gut watched as his arm was broken, and a wave of pain suddenly shot through him. Ah! He screamed as the knife was dropped. The other two, Barsol and Hurl, were shocked as they saw their friend cry out like a child. Hey! Both of them shouted and rushed over. Dirk threw Gut aside as he squared up to the two men. Both pulled out their own knives, Barsol slashing toward Dirk first. Slice! The knife sailed, but was dodged. Dirk threw out his leg the next moment, slamming his shin bone into Barsol's calf. Barsol was thrown off balance, flipping to the ground. Ack! Barsol grunted as surging pain came from his leg. Dirk moved on to Harrell. Harrell was quick to slash out with his own knife. However, he kept his balance and distance. Dirk dodged, but couldn't counter. This happened a few more times. Dirk maneuvering around the path of the knife every time. Then, Dirk found an opening. After Harrell slashed, Dirk moved in and threw out his fist, planting it in his gut. Harrell felt the wind shoot out of him. Though, this would be underestimating the power of the punch. Dirk held nothing back, and under his rank three strength, Harrell's organs were shaken. Thud. Ugh. Harrell could only collapse on himself. His stomach felt like it was about to explode, and he couldn't even keep himself upright. He curled into a ball, letting out miserable wails as blood seeped from his mouth and nostrils. By now though, Barsol had recovered. He jumped to his feet, limping slightly from the pain in his leg. Seeing Harrell, he panicked a bit, but he had a knife that gave him confidence. He jumped at Dirk, waving his knife about in an attempt to cut him. Only. Dirk was too nimble, and all of Barsal's movements were easily read. Dirk moved as if this were a choreographed dance. However, instead of finding an opening, he made his own. Spike Pillar Casting Spike Pillar Dirk gave a command, and his AI instantly picked up on it. A magic circle glowed on top of his hand. Barsal saw this and realized Dirk was a mage. But he knew mages needed a casting time, so he wasn't worried as he closed distance to mess up Dirk's concentration. Unfortunately, this wasn't a normally cast spell. A second didn't even pass before the ground in front of Barsol opened up. Since he had lunged forward, he was unable to dodge the long spike that surged toward his leg. Pooh! Ah! Barsol screamed as the spike pierced into his thigh. The spike was tough not breaking under his weight. And because he was abruptly stopped, his leg twisted around the spike, tearing the muscles. Dirk stepped forward to attack again, but suddenly, he heard a shout. Dirk! Ava's voice came from behind. He instantly turned and saw her backing away from Gut. Gut had a broken arm, but that didn't stop him from using his other arm to attack. He chased Ava, trying to cut her with his knife. Fortunately, she took it upon herself to evade, creating distance. Her anima training gave her quick movements not unlike Dirk's. Another thing that helped was Gut using his non-dominant arm. Seeing Gut attack Ava, Dirk felt his bloodlust surge. He lifted his hand, and two rock arrows instantly appeared above it. 
this was his instant casting given by the AI. Whoosh! One arrow flew out. Gut spotted this in the corner of his eye, but was baffled by how fast it moved. He attempted to dodge, but the rock arrow arrived too quickly. The arrowhead met the skin of his leg. Slice! Arg! Gut yelled as the arrow tore through his thigh. He fell to his knees. However, that wasn't the only arrow. He panicked as he saw Dirk bring down his other hand. Pooh! This time, the arrow impaled his side, piercing through and out the other. Gut felt blood seep into his mouth as his organs were torn through. He felt dread. Unfortunately, Dirk intended to let him wallow in pain. He turned to Barsoul who was pulling his leg out of the rock spike. He barely did so and fell to the ground, the hole in his leg spurting out blood. And no. Wait, please. You can't kill me. Barsoul cried out please as Dirk approached. From seemingly nowhere, Dirk had pulled out a knife. Barsoul felt his life slipping away as Dirk stepped closer. Unfortunately, Dirk didn't listen. Or, he didn't have the mind to listen. His eyes were apathetic, releasing no aura of threat. Inside though, he was surging with the desire to kill. Unknowingly, a black film extended out from his hand, covering the blade of the knife like a black fog. Barsoul had picked up his own knife and slashed at Dirk from the ground, trying to keep distance. However, with a well-timed movement, Dirk flicked his hand. Slice. Barsoul watched as his hand flew off, landing a few feet away. The cut was perfect, as if Dirk wielded the sharpest blade in the world. Dirk bent down, about to plunge his darkness-covered knife into Barsoul's chest. Barsoul himself had started screaming again, apparently in blood-curdling pain. Before Dirk could finish him though, he spotted Harel who had recovered enough to start running away in the corner of his eye. Letting out a small breath, Dirk raised his arm with the knife in hand. He then brought it down, throwing the knife with oppressive strength. The blade flipped as it sailed through the air. Harel wasn't looking back, totally focused on running. He was interrupted though by a burning sensation in his back. That burning sensation rapidly worsened, turning into an unbearable pressure as the blade tore open his lung from behind. Harel collapsed to the ground, unable to even scream. Dirk turned back to Barsoul who continued to scream. Looking around, Dirk picked up the knife from Barsoul's severed hand. No! Barsoul pleaded again, but Dirk didn't hesitate. He smoothly plunged the knife into Barsoul's neck, cutting off all sound. Kill count, one-third. He stood up as his AI rang out with a notification. He turned his head back to Harel. Since it had only been several seconds, Harel wasn't dead yet. He would die eventually though, so Dirk didn't bother with him as he shifted his gaze to Gut. Gut was still kneeled on the floor, arrow in stomach. He was suffering miserably. Seeing him groan, Dirk felt the corner of his mouth ever so slightly rise. He walked over. What was that you said earlier? You would hurt that little girlfriend of mine? Did you think that was funny? Did you think that was smart? Why must you threaten my friend? Dirk yelled, bringing back his leg and swinging. Bang! Arg! His leg slammed into Gut's abdomen, sending him tumbling. This time, blood poured from his mouth and nose. Dirk walked over, picking him up by his neck. You think I want to do this? I just wanted to have a nice little chat, but you had to interrupt me. Then you had to threaten me. I didn't want to hurt anyone anymore. I was fine with killing monsters but now you've forced me to kill people. Why? Dirk spat in Gut's face. Gut sniffled as he barely opened his mouth. We were hired. Hired? Dirk's eyes zoned out hearing that word. It implied so much. Someone hired these three to attack him. He was being targeted. This wasn't random, but planned. But who would target him? He was just a kid from the academy out on a little adventure. He didn't even have money on him. His armor, the most valuable items he had, were in his room. If someone wanted money, they would go there. But they came to him. This person wanted to harm him specifically. 
he thought and thought, but nothing came to him. In this world, nobody knew who he was. This was a new life for him. He shouldn't be getting into any conflict with anyone. But now, conflict was coming to him. Why? This is another damn world. I know nobody here. I'm just some kid. Why am I being attacked? Dirk's mind became chaotic. Rage burned inside of him. He had escaped Earth, but now, the same problems were coming back to him. It was like he was a magnet for trouble. He thought back, remembering his conversation with that psychopath girl. The walking incarnation of bad luck. Was he really? He didn't want to believe it. Suddenly, his eyes zoned in. By now, Ga was choking on his own blood. Seeing this pathetic excuse for a human, Dirk gritted his teeth. His grip tightened around his throat. His arm raised, picking Gut up off the floor. Gut looked into those dark eyes of Dirk's, feeling the terror of death. Crack! Then, his body went limp. Dirk dropped him after crushing his throat, the corpse falling to the ground with a thud. Three kills confirmed. Threats eliminated. The AI spoke. Gut and Barsol had been personally ended by him, and Harel had already died from his broken lung. Three bodies lay on the floor, pools of blood spilling from all of them. Dirk? As Dirk contemplated, his attention was caught by Ava's voice. He turned to her. Ava was looking at him with a slightly horrified gaze. Dirk had mercilessly killed three people in front of her. Although they had threatened them first, she didn't expect things to devolve this far. Dirk wanted to explain, but now wasn't the time. Some people were already looking at them from afar. Dirk turned and walked to Harl's corpse, pulling out his knife. He then sheathed it before walking to Ava. She leaned back as he approached. He grabbed her hand. We need to go. Ava looked at Dirk for a second before lightly nodding. She let him pull her along, the two hurrying back to their inn. Upon arriving outside his room, Dirk pulled out his knife. He looked at the doorknob, seeing nothing out of the ordinary. All doors had a lock, so if someone tampered with it then he would notice. Grabbing it, he quickly twisted before shoving the door open and looking inside. He was greeted with nothing. He looked around at all his items, seeing that everything remained as it had been when he left. He sighed in relief and walked in. He went to go change his clothes which had gotten some blood splatter on them. Once he was changed, he sat down on a bed. Ava stood to the side, unsure of what to do. Sorry you had to see that. Dirk eventually spoke. Ava remained silent. She truly didn't know what to say. On one hand, Dirk had brutally killed three people in broad daylight. Killing monsters was one thing. But not only did Dirk kill three people, he did it so easily. It almost seemed like this was easier than killing monsters for him. She couldn't understand how he could take a life so easily. And then there were the things he said. Things about being forced to kill. While his words didn't initially seem odd, they brought up several questions. Did he already have experience with this? It was like he had escaped something, and this event brought him back. The disconnect between his words and what Ava knew about him baffled her to no end. She could only assume this was related to his secrets, the ones he couldn't yet tell her. She wanted to be scared. Simply seeing a dead person was shocking enough. To see them be killed was another level of trauma. But there were two things that comforted her. One was the fact that she had killed monster before. Humanoid ones at that. Sure people and monsters were different but the experience of personally spilling blood and ending the life of a living thing introduced her to the concept of death, numbing her even if just a little. It made seeing the pools of red blood and lethal wounds on those three men less shocking. Second was the fact that Dirk was defending her. They had been surrounded by men with weapons, cornered with nowhere to escape. In that moment, she forgot she was a mage and a body refiner. She reverted back to thinking she was a normal person, with no power to speak of. She had placed herself on the same level as those men. But the truth was far from that. She was above them. Those men weren't mages, and they were barely body refiners. 
Ava surpassed them in every aspect. She could have killed them herself. But she didn't, and it was Dirk that stepped in to solve the problem. She thought to herself. Dirk was like her leader, her inspiration. She followed in his examples of strength. What he did, she should be able to do. She trained herself to be stronger mentally and physically. She had trained to be strong in the face of conflict. But as soon as she was faced with real conflict, she cowered. She left it to him to solve. If she were strong, like him, she should have been able to handle herself. Thinking this, she felt ashamed. But although she felt ashamed, she couldn't help but remember how scary it was to be faced with true danger. She had no armor, no weapons, no security. One stab, and her life would be threatened. In the face of that kind of danger, she felt helpless. Suddenly, she was overwhelmed with emotion. She felt anger. She was angry at herself. She was wrestling between fear and strength. She wanted to be strong, but the fear within her was powerful. And this was after she had told Dirk that she wanted to help him. It made her feel like a hypocrite. She couldn't help the tears that fell from her eyes. I. I should have helped. She let out a cry, causing Dirk to turn to her. I was stupid. I didn't help at all. I should have, but I was scared. I shouldn't have been scared. She yelled, but not at Dirk. Dirk frowned at her cries. Hey. He stood up, walking to her. She turned her head away. There was nothing for you to do there. Yes there was. There were enemies, and I should have fought them. No, you shouldn't have. Look at me. Dirk commanded. Ava barely raised her head, looking at him through the tears that blurred her vision. He spoke with a low voice. Those were people, not just some enemies from a dungeon. You have never taken the life of a person, and today was not going to be the day that you did so. Do not be mad at yourself for not solving a problem you should have never been faced with. I should at least have been able to solve it. But I was scared. And that's okay. After Ava shouted, Dirk shouted back. It's okay to be scared. Ava, you're a teenager. This is not something that you should be able to solve at such a young age. Then why were you able to? Because I'm not like you. Dirk's pupils contracted as his voice became rough. I've killed people before, Ava. I've done some very nasty things, and I've seen even worse. Ava I know you try to follow in my footsteps, trying to be strong. But this, this isn't one of those things you should be looking up to. Don't wish this bloody path upon yourself, and don't go hating yourself for being scared. Listen to me when I say that you did nothing wrong. Ava went silent, Dirk's voice echoing in her mind. After yelling, Dirk turned around and sat himself on the bed, calming his breathing. This series of events was getting him too riled up. Ava stood there, staring blankly into space. There was silence for almost a minute before Dirk spoke again. Ava, I know you want to be strong, but we all have our limits. This situation was beyond yours. Someday, you'll be able to hold your own and face those fears. But that day was not today. And that's okay. You have time. Please, don't be so hard on yourself. Let me handle these things. Dirk spoke almost pleadingly. From the depths of his soul, he didn't wish upon Ava what had been forced upon him. When he was put in a situation to kill or be killed, he was forced to kill. He was broken, then numbed, turned into nothing more than a killing machine. But after coming to this world, he realized how much he wished to stay away from such a life. He saw things from another perspective, and he realized how torn apart he had been. Now more than ever didn't want that for himself. He wanted the nice life that he had, with a friend and his family. Traveling the towns, killing monsters in dungeons, looting them for valuables that he could sell for money. These things seemed like the perfect way to go. It was a life of adventure and peace, one that Dirk had secretly come to love. But now, he had killed three people. This tore open old wounds that he thought he healed from. And his friend was wishing that she were like him. She was mistaking his inhuman nature with strength. 
he wanted to correct that. He wanted her to know that it was okay to have the weakness she did. If she forced herself, she would develop a trauma. She would twist herself in her thinking. That wasn't courage, but derangement. Through his words, Ava could feel the plea. Suddenly, she was beginning to understand a bit about what his secret was. It obviously wasn't good, and she could sense the deep scars he kept hidden. More than anything though, she really wanted to trust him. Right now, she was a scared girl, a fact she hated but had to deal with. She wanted to rely on someone in the hopes of making things a bit less scary. So she put away her pride and made a decision, nodding her head. Okay. I'll leave it to you. Will you? Yes. Good. Thank you. Dirk sighed in relief. The next moment, Ava buried her head in his chest. He hugged and rubbed her back, comforting her as she cried a bit more, letting out her frustration and fear.